Good afternoon. I think, as everybody knows, um, our command center and the rest of our team has been working with our colleagues in the healthcare community to prepare the Commonwealth for the surge in COVID-19 cases that we all know is coming. Um, we've been working this issue on a number of different fronts because slowing the spread of the virus requires us to use every tool that's available to us. Yesterday, you heard our de detailed projections uh, as they currently stand with respect to case numbers and our planning efforts to increase medical and bed capacity for that surge when it arrives. Secretary Sutters and the command center have been working with hospitals to make sure they have the capacity that they need to treat future cases of COVID-19. And we're continuing to work with suppliers and with the federal government around much needed uh, personal protective equipment. Those efforts are key to getting the Commonwealth prepared to treat patients, but there's another critical part of this which involves efforts to increase the state's testing capacity. And as of yesterday, we completed over 56,000 tests so far. We're up to 20 labs conducting tests. And as many know, we set a goal about 10 days ago to complete 3,500 tests a day. We've been consistently hitting or exceeding that goal, and yesterday reported almost 5,000 tests alone. We're going to continue to expand opportunities for new testing capacity and new testing sites as labs keep up with our growth in capacity. On Sunday, for example, there'll be a new drive-through testing site for first responders that will open in Foxborough at Gillette Stadium in the parking lot where they expect to test up to 200 first responders a day. This is a great collaboration between the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, the New England Patriots, the Department of Corrections, WellPath, and Quest Diagnostics, which I think, as many of you know, has a pretty aggressive testing facility operating in Marlboro. The test will be provided to police officers, firefighters, and other public safety personnel, and it is free of charge. We'll have more details coming out on that soon. Increasing testing comes with an increase in the number of confirmed cases. We've talked about this before. And the next step of our surge preparations involves increasing our ability to trace and isolate cases. We've mentioned before that the command center has been working to ramp up the Commonwealth's tracing program which is another big part of our effort to fight back against the virus. Today, I'm excited to announce the creation of the COVID-19 Community Tracing Collaborative, which will be a partnership between our command center, Partners in Health, who you will hear from shortly, the Department of Public Health, and the Health Connector. Enhanced tracing capacity is an enormously powerful tool for public health officials to rely on in their battle against COVID-19. We're working toward a goal of getting staffed and ready to go on this effort by the end of this month. And what we mean by tracing is that when a person tests positive, public health officials gather information from that person about who else they could have infected. These people are known as close contacts. Public health officials then attempt to contact them, those close contacts, who could have been infected. And then those close contacts are made aware that they need to quarantine or get tested themselves. As a reminder, there is tracing happening now, but this program that we're talking about launching today is a much more robust, targeted approach that we hope can be highly effective at slowing the spread of this highly infectious disease. And to be successful, it will take a coordinated effort and resources. And it's going to be a big part of our ongoing effort uh, to manage and fight our way through COVID-19. I do want to mention a couple of other efforts before I get to that. We're working with hospitals and public safety officials constantly to prepare for what will be a difficult time over the next three or four weeks. And as we discussed yesterday, our models suggest cases are likely to increase rapidly in the coming weeks, and the strain on our healthcare system will be unprecedented. But we're also focused on the long game for how we can monitor, isolate, and put our communities in a position to mitigate the number of new COVID-19 cases over time, and that's where this tracing initiative comes in. By monitoring and isolating through an enhanced community tracing program, our state can be positioned to reduce the number of cases, new cases, in the long run. 
Staffed by a team of epidemiologists, the Department of Public Health works directly with every local Board of Health across the Commonwealth already. Case tracing work will be conducted under the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences, who will remain the epidemiological experts in all case tracing efforts. This network has experience conducting tracing efforts, but clearly COVID-19 is a whole new frontier and therefore requires a significantly enhanced strategy and platform. Our new community tracing program will stand up a virtual call center that will consist of nearly a thousand virtual contact tracers, many of which have already signed up to help. Staff will contact COVID-19 patients to learn about their recent activities and ensure that they're taking appropriate steps to get healthy and to not spread the virus further. The call center will get contact information for as many people as possible that they have come in contact with and potentially exposed people will be contacted and informed so that they can stay healthy, isolate when appropriate, and prevent further spread as well. As we put this in place, we've started to place volunteers from our non-academic health departments, from our nine academic health departments, to provide direct support to local boards of health to keep pace with escalating case tracing requirements. 170 students have been connected to 35 local health departments to assist with case tracing, public health messaging, and communications to support local health departments. This effort will continue to scale over the next few weeks as we stand up the rest of this project. And here's where I say we are enormously fortunate to have a proven player with a global reputation that is well-deserved and partners in health on board to help with this project. I think many people know that Partners in Health is a global health nonprofit that's based here in Boston, and they have a proven track record of creating successful public health interventions that have made a profound and significant difference during previous epidemics and pandemics around the world. Partners in Health will hire, handle the coordination of the staff by hiring, training, and virtually deploying the contract, contact tracers. Some of the other partners in this project will include Accenture and Salesforce, private sector partners who will be providing logistical and organizational resources to this effort. What we're doing here today is the beginning of a breaking of new ground in the fight against COVID-19. Massachusetts will be the only state in the country putting together this kind of programming. There's no nationwide tracking that's currently being done, and we anticipate that we need to get out ahead of this and do everything we possibly can here in Massachusetts to deal with COVID-19 in the aftermath, through and in the aftermath of the surge. We are home, as everybody knows, to many world-class healthcare institutions and so much hardworking and brilliant healthcare talent. We have the ability to lead on how we respond to this public health threat in the long term. And launching this program is a major way that we are harnessing the talent and brain power of our healthcare field to implement this program. You're going to hear in a minute from some of the experts about how the program will work in more detail. But from our point of view, we need to take advantage of every tool we, we have in the toolbox to help limit exposure to this very dangerous and very contagious disease. And pursuing this program gives us the type of collaborative, expansive, and broad tracing program that has proven effective in many places in other past significant public health crises. We'll provide more information as we get closer to the launch, but we're going to strongly encourage people in Massachusetts who are COVID-19 patients and their close contacts to work with the collaborative as it gets up and operating. This is a great example of how and why we're all in this together. Because by sharing information and working with the collaborative, we can fight back against COVID-19 together, limit the spread, and put every available resource we have to work on this issue. There are a lot of people to thank these days, and we should all take a moment and think about those who are around us that are working through this unprecedented time. I especially want to express my condolences to the family and friends of the hardworking MBTA employee that we talked about yesterday who passed away earlier this week. Let's face it, 
the men and the women who are operating critical govern government services like the MBTA every single day deserve our gratitude. Because without them, nurses, medical workers, grocery store workers, and a whole host of other people we are all relying on right now would have a very hard time getting to and from where they need to go. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Joya McCurchy, who is the Medical Director of Partners in Health. Thank you very much, Governor Baker, Secretary Sutters, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Commissioner Burrell. Partners in Health is deeply humbled at being invited to support the Commonwealth at this very, very trying time. We are, as the governor said, a global medical nonprofit that have wor has worked to prevent, care, and treat people all over the world. Whether fighting Ebola in West Africa, tackling HIV and TB for a generation, or facing the sudden emergence of cholera in Haiti, we at Partners in Health know that even as we prepare the hospitals in the Commonwealth, to provide safe and effective care to all of the people who are sick, whether they are sick with COVID or not, we must simultaneously stop the ongoing spread of COVID-19 if we are to end this terrible pandemic. For over a century, epidemic control has relied on the tracing of contacts, contacts of infected people. Access to this information helps contacts to know how to protect their loved ones, to get tested or cared for themselves. Social distancing measures that the governor has led are important. They are an important first step in slowing transmission. But without knowing our own status, without being able to specifically protect our loved ones, we are all living in the dark. We know that there is significant anxiety in this darkness. Many people say, well, we're staying at home anyway, so what's the difference? It is an enormous difference if you know that you have been in contact with someone who has COVID-19. That is the point of the Contact Tracing Collaborative. Senior clinicians at Partners in Health, who are also faculty at the great hospitals in Boston, the Brigham and Women's and Children's Hospital, will stand up this massive force to hire, chain, and supervise contact tracers who will fortify and support existing programs in the Commonwealth through the Department of Health and the Secretary's Office. We believe that people want to know if they have been in contact with this disease. And I will break it down to you in three levels. Right now, we have the base of the pyramid, which is social isolation. You see that we are standing six feet or more apart. We are staying within our family units, and that is good, and that will slow the transmission. That will limit the number of people we're in contact with. But I, live with three people. One person in my family, my mom, is, is my mom. She's older. If I have been in contact with someone with COVID, I would want to know. I would then be instructed not to be sharing a meal with her, to wipe down the surfaces in my home, to use my own bathroom if that's available, which is not for everyone. And then I would get a test. And in my family unit, if I was tested positive for COVID-19, I may need to go somewhere else, in my case, maybe to a hotel, so that I don't spread the virus. Social distancing, quarantine, isolation. This is the pyramid we're talking about. Now, as I'm saying that, I'm a physician. I can easily separate myself within my own household from my family but many people cannot. And that's where social services and social support come in uh, and become so important. We need to make sure that everyone who is in contact with a person who has COVID has the material resources and the psychological resources to safely quarantine 
or isolate. And that's why we're grateful for the leadership of Secretary Sutters and the focus on social support. And we will simultaneously be letting people know that they are in contact with a person with COVID and reaching out to the vulnerable to connect them county by county with available social services. That may mean isolation facilities. In some places, it might mean a hotel. That might mean giving them additional food support. And so that is why knowing one's status will shine the light on this epidemic and make it possible for Governor Baker's great vision of having the Commonwealth lead on stopping transmission can happen. The other pyramid I want to talk about is the pyramid of transmission. We have been focused in the United States on the top 20% of the pyramid, the 20% of people who are sick with COVID, and we care deeply about them. We want to make sure they have access to ventilators and the staff that's taking care of them has access to PPE. But there is 80% of the pyramid that are people with mild symptoms or even asymptomatic that are silently and unknowingly spreading the disease. We want to shine a light on that, a light with love and compassion that can reach out to people and humanely let them know that they are at risk and humanely help them to isolate themselves. So it is a great honor. I want to thank my colleagues, KJ Sung, Emily Rowe, and John Welsh, as well as the rest of the team from Partners in Health, and the amazing collaboration we've had with the Commonwealth Connector, as well as the Department of Public Health in making this happen. I want to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Farmer, one of the founders of Partners in Health, and I, have to, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other co-founders, Ophelia Dahl, and Jim Kim. Dr. Jim Kim has been instrumental in this uh, work as well. And Paul is now the chief strategist at Partners in Health and will make a few remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joya. And again, I'd like to echo her in noting that it is such a great privilege um, and accorded to us by Governor Baker and his administration, Lieutenant Government the governor and the secretary, thank you for allowing us to participate as citizens of the Commonwealth. I would just add to what Joya said that she and many of us working with Partners in Health have seen what it is like when the surge is not flattened and the care delivery system of an entire nation is wiped out. And that is true in more than one instance. I'm thinking a lot right now about our experience over the last few years with Ebola in West Africa. There, the steps that Governor Baker and his administration are proposing were not taken in time. There were not the resources necessary to flatten any curves. And so in at least three countries, the healthcare delivery system was flattened itself. This is one of the things we wish to avoid here in addition to the objectives outlined by the governor and by Joria. So we've seen what it's like when it happens, and this time around, we're going to see what it's like when the full Monty, to use Jim's term, the full Monty is applied. Uh, the pyramid from top to bottom tended to. And I would like to underline one thing that Joya said, is that this effort at containment and disease control is motivated by love and should be informed by compassion and expert mercy, and that relies on science on using the data that we have at our disposal to address a rapidly unfolding tragedy. Containment must be linked to good care, good medical care. And as a clinician, as clinicians, Joy and I have seen what a difference that can make. It cannot, however, stop the spread of, COVID of coronavirus um, and prevent COVID-19. Here we have before us the chance to have a truly effective public-private partnership, bringing together clinicians from some of Boston's best teaching hospitals with the staff of Partners in Health and the authorities in the Commonwealth all the way to the top. Um, I'm not good at sports analogies, but to quote Jim Kim and Sheila Davis, who evidently are, the, Sheila being the director of Partners in Health, we, it is time to go on offense, 
Um, I am grateful as a, citizen, as a citizen, I'm grateful as a physician, I'm grateful as a Brigham and Women's physician and a Harvard Medical School professor to join this effort and to watch our colleagues, who will increase in number rapidly, address this problem with the expert mercy that is called for in these times. Thank you. Let me start with some on topic, either for me or for either of the doctors. On the contact tracing, uh, the timing, is it, is it the right time? Is it too late? Uh, where, where, where do you come from? So um, we actually talked. Yeah, we can talk. About, yeah, fine. You can take that one. We talked about this one upstairs. You know, we've, we've heard that question a lot. Um, and let me just tell you um, about a town called Tonkalili. Tonkalili is a small district in Sierra Leone. It was the place that was home of the last, the very last Ebola uh, 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 person, the person who was infected with Ebola in Sierra Leone. Every single contact was traced in that country, and Ebola is different than COVID, but it's highly infectious, a highly deadly. And in a country like Sierra Leone, once you cross that border into this little unknown place called Tonkalili, everybody would get out of the car, be screened, temperature written down, cell phone numbers. If they can do this in a place like Tonkalili, how can we say it is too late in the Commonwealth? To me, these are basic bread and butter public health. It will be hard, and we are daunted by the challenge, but we are undaunted by the moral need to stop the epidemic. So is it too late? It cannot be too late. We need to mitigate the suffering now. Let me, let me just let me pile on there a little bit. Um, I know everybody in this room and many others keep track of how many cases we have in Massachusetts. We have about 9,000 cases as of yesterday's reported results. Um, yesterday, the Lieutenant Governor, the Secretary, and I stood here and talked about the fact that we thought, uh, based on the modeling we'd done, that the ultimate number of people who were likely to be um, infected here in the Commonwealth would be somewhere between 47,000 and 170,000. Okay, so um, from where I sit, uh, I view us as early in this game with respect to the issue associated with contact tracing. And while the Department of Public Health and the local boards, especially with some of the additional funding and support that we've provided them, um, have the ability to play this game at a level of seven, eight, five, nine thousand. When you start getting into numbers like the types of numbers we're talking about in our projections, um, you need a much bigger organization with a lot more infrastructure to actually create the kind of contact tracing program and all the elements that come with it to be able to chase, literally, let's say we end up with 47,000 cases or 50,000 or 70,000 or 100,000 or 120,000, all right? That is not the kind of um, scenario where you could rely on uh, the Department of Public Health and the local boards to make that happen. You need a much bigger platform with a ton of technology, which is where Salesforce and Accenture come in, and a lot of big time experience with the capacity to grow um, the number of people and the number of players who are part of that scenario. And that's the reason why we're bringing um, partners in health in as a partner. So no, I don't think it's too late. In fact, I think um, on this particular part of the game, um, we're probably just getting started. Governor, can we have, um, are you able to determine with this information what is the most likely spot somebody could get the virus or be exposed to it with all of the tracing and stuff that's going to be in a supermarket or, or just walking your neighborhood? Are you able to pinpoint exactly how people are getting exposed to it? So, um, the, the 60,000 foot answer to your question, which is probably as far as I'm willing to go today, I mean, I'll look at these guys and see if they want to go deeper, um, is one of the things that we believe will become doable in a reasonable way once we start ramping this up is the ability to do a little more predictive modeling about, um, about hotspots. And, um, and from my point of view, that will make, uh, that's a big part of what the doctor talked about when she talked about Jim Kim's notion of stop playing defense and start playing offense. But to be able to do that, you need to create a much bigger data set than the one we have now and have the 
data capacity to do the analytics and to chase. And that's exactly where I would like to end up at some point on this. Governor, are you confident that we have the testing capacity and we'll be having perpetual testing capacity to make something like tracing work in the long run? So there's a bunch of stuff going on on tracing, uh, on testing right now that I think is important to remember. The first is, you know, two weeks ago, were we doing 350 a day two weeks ago? I don't think so. And now we're doing 3,500 and more. And my guess is we'll probably get over that number pretty soon. And the other thing to remember about testing generally is uh, there are a whole series of new technologies and, um, and new tools that are going to become part of the, the realm of the possible and the doable in the not too distant future. I mean, some of you have written about CFIT, which has created a much faster test that runs on a much smaller platform that can be done in a clinic or in a doctor's office. Abbott, which has been doing um, influenza testing for years in clinics and in doctor's offices, is now converting its capacity to do, um, to do uh, COVID-19 testing as well. That's a, much, that's a whole new set of players and operators who can expand the Commonwealth's ability uh, to test. But there are two other big things going on, one of which relates to antibodies. I don't know, do you want to talk about how that's been used in other places? Because I think that's important. Okay. Governor, before you, I, I know we're so the answer is yes. Okay, so you are confident that we will have enough. Why don't you, why don't you speak to that one? Because that's the more likely to believe. We're you. confident. I, I, I think we have to work together and we have to make it happen. I mean, again, working in incredibly resource starved, and impoverished situations, I've seen this scaled up in nations that are as large, you know, as the Commonwealth, six, seven million people. And if you can do it there, we can do it here. What we need is political will, which we have from Governor Baker. So I think we're all pulling together and the new technologies are interesting. Antibody tests, which were used in Korea, um, are a way to show if people have been exposed, if they have the immune response, if they've mounted immune response, and with more information and more data, we may be able to get people back to work based on antibody tests. So I think the more we are able to look at the data, the more data we have, we can protect the vulnerable, we may be able to get the healthy back to work, and we think this investment in really understanding the epidemic in the Commonwealth will be a game changer also to get back to normal. And, and instead of just waiting, I think the problem with this idea of is it too late, well, we could just wait. We could just wait till 60 to 80% of people are infected, and maybe then that level of immunity will start bending the curve down. I don't want to wait that long, and I don't think it's humane to, to wait that long, and we know that Governor Baker and his administration doesn't either. Can you speak in uh, layman's terms? Uh, can you speak in layman's terms that people are watching? And you can be just calling people at their houses. No one answers their phones. No one answers their cell phone. You can text them. You're going to show a stranger going to show up at somebody's house saying your friend has COVID-19. You need to be tested. How can we talk about anxiety? Can you explain yeah. in basic terms for people that are watching? What yeah. Are so one thing is we rely on all of you in the media. Uh, we rely on all the citizenry to understand, again, that this comes from a place of compassion, right? We want to have mass media campaigns about the importance of contact tracing so that people, when they get a phone call and it says COVID community team, they'll answer that phone. We don't want to stigmatize people. We're, all of this is voluntary. Nothing would be coercive, but people want to know their status. And so we're going to rely on all of you uh, to help push out the communication that this is to make us better informed and safer. This is to help end the epidemic sooner and get us back to the business of, you know, living in the Commonwealth of Mass sooner. And so that needs to be a, a media campaign that you will be called. A number will appear on your phone that says com uh, community care, COVID community care team. You should answer that phone so you can be informed. Then you will call your clinician. If you don't have one, we're, we're working to be able to put people in touch with the clinician and then get a test. So hopefully this shining a light on the epidemic will be less anxiety than living in the darkness about not knowing where it is and, and if you've been in contact. Doctor, is there a um, suggestion
suggested or recommended timeline, or maybe this is a question for uh, state officials about when people should expect to get a phone call or have someone reaching out to them if they've potentially been exposed? So keep in mind that people have been getting phone calls and have had people reaching out to them since the first case in Massachusetts. Um, that's exactly what the Department of Public Health and the local boards of health have been doing. Um, the big issue here is not about um, a dramatic alteration with respect to the fundamental notion of what's being done here. That's going to be consistent with what the local boards of health and the, and the Department of Public Health has already been doing in terms of reaching out to people who've had close contact with folks who've tested positive and then acting accordingly based on that information. The difference here is the difference between doing this for a few thousand people and doing it for tens of thousands of people. But the fundamental model with respect to what the basic end game is here and the, and the mechanism uh, to pursue that is going to be pretty much the same. The change is as we collect more data and as we have more information, we can then start to do some things with that data to start drawing uh, potential conclusions and making strategic decisions about where we think the places we have the biggest issues are and how we might be able to use you, the media, and others to message to people about that. Remember, we're, we're at 9,000 now. We were at, I'm going to say we were at 5,000 maybe 10 days ago. Less? So, I mean, we're talking about needing a program in place here. If we get to some of the numbers that we've talked about yesterday in our, um, in our surge projections and beyond, they're going to require a very different um, capability and platform to be able to get to all the people who have been, in fact, connected to people who are, in fact, um, tested positive. Do we know so how to actually carry out this, this mission? You should speak to them. thousands of people, and can some of the people who just applied for unemployment... Yes! Apply I mean, I think one of the most appealing aspects of this idea is if you think of money coming in for stimulus, if you think of unemployment, this is surging across the country. What if those monies were aligned with actually ending the epidemic and creating jobs? So we know that we will be hiring about a thousand people, paying them a decent wage, um, and that could be expanded. And so I think part of this vision is to say, let's also alleviate the suffering of people who are otherwise unemployed with good jobs that will be, they, be, they will be put to work actually stopping the epidemic. What sort of skills would they need for this job? Um, so, you know, they need to be a bit tech savvy. Uh, at least able to use a cell phone, an app, a computer interface, and most importantly, to be humane and able to speak um, kindly to people. Uh, we want people of different language abilities, of course, uh, and so we're, we're hoping, and we already have had uh, people sign up, and those uh, things would be going live soon. Governor, updates on the situation? Why don't I let Secretary Sutter speak to that? I didn't want to come up with the governor's talking points. Thank you. I'm just, sorry. So um, the total numbers at the Holyoke Soldier Home as of today, we've had 21 veteran resident deaths, 15 were positive tests, two negative, one unknown, and three pending. We have uh, now completed the testing of all the veterans. 59 veterans have tested positive, and 160 have tested negative. We have created, um, under the leadership of Val Liptic, we have created um, uh, basically separate zones within the, or separate units within the home. So we have created, um, units for individuals who've tested positive, units for people who have tested negative, so that we can ensure that people are appropriately isolated and treated. The Clinical Command Center is working with the Holyoke Medical Center to create additional capacity at the medical center if we need to transfer individuals who are acutely ill. 
We've also added an infection control nurse who started, I believe, yesterday, um, and we expect um, additional staff resources. We have the National Guard who are there, uh, both National Guard who are there as um, what I would call environmental and food staff, as well as the National Guard who are medical corps who are expanding and augmenting the staff. In terms of um, Chelsea, as we have reported before, um, there, have on, there have been two resident deaths. I want to share this question regarding the um, nursing homes a little bit more about the nursing homes. In terms of, uh, especially with the Norwood case that came up, there is a lot of guidance out there for nursing homes regarding uh, what they should be doing. But I'm curious if there's any thoughts about doing something more, given the fact that they have suddenly, and it was anticipated obviously, but they've suddenly become you know, really very difficult spots. Um, so, as we know, individuals who are older adults with underlying medical conditions, of course, are uh, more prone and more vulnerable uh, to COVID-19. Uh, very early on, I think around March 16th, we restricted visitation to nursing homes across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and have again taken additional measures around really restricting access. Put out guidance very early uh, that was uh, consistent with the CDC guidelines, which I think you're referencing, uh, to help nursing home operators prepare for the epidemic, for the pandemic, which we now have. We've put in place mobile testing um, for nursing homes specifically because we understood that nursing homes to take patients, residents from nursing homes to hospitals to be tested was not humane, compassionate, or good. And so we, this week, rolled out mobile testing, again, with our National Guard, and we're expanding that for residents and the like. Um, and we are obviously, we have uh, both nurses from the Department of Public Health and epidemiologists on site and in contact with nursing homes that have that have clusters of patients in their homes. Will the secretary give an update on the Norwood, uh, Norwood uh, Charwell? Do you have an update on the numbers? So we have. Um, so we have. Uh, my information is that of of what is being reported is 15 deaths, eight were COVID positive. Um, so that's the information I had as of this morning. Uh, and again, um, when we have clusters, when nursing homes report. Uh, we have a nurse from the Department of Public Health and an epidemiologist in daily contact with those facilities to ensure that they are isolating, quarantining residents and following the protocols of the CDC. Are we Secretary, testing people post-mortem if, if they're in a nursing home, they die, maybe a respiratory ailment, but we don't know if it's COVID. Are they testing post-mortem so you have this data? Yes. So we are testing, um, we are testing individuals who die um, after after they die to determine whether they are um, COVID positive, yes. Secretary, is there any indication? Yesterday, uh, I'm sorry. The New York Times has been reporting that the CIA doesn't believe a lot of these Chinese facts and figures of what went on in Wuhan and other provinces. Does that undermine the models that you were putting together that are based on Chinese data, as I understand it? So the, the modeling that we um, used it was based on the, the JAMA article, the Journal of American Medical Association's article of the study of Wuhan, um, which is really the only academic paper that has been out modeling, as well as used experience in Italy, uh, and uh, at least Italy, and as the governor said, uh, talked to a lot of epidemiologists to adapt our model. I mean, that is the, that is the model we have available, and models, as we've said before, are valuable to help us plan, they're not infallible. Secretary, is there any indication that there would be a need for maybe disciplinary action or more intervention at any of the other facilities? Or what is the key difference here between the Chelsea and Norwood facilities and what happened at the Holyoke Soldiers Home, as far as you know now? So let me, why don't I speak about um, Chelsea and Holyoke, because those are two soldiers' homes that are within the, the auspices of state government. Um, so. There's, and I think we talked about this the other day, um, so if I'm repeating myself, my apologies. Um, there is, at Chelsea, there was a very clear uh, incident command center established in response uh, to COVID-19. So there was strong infection controls put in place, there's a strong team in place, and when um, individuals were identified, they were immediately, uh, anyone who was symptomatic, um, was immediately quarantined, and you see the differences between Chelsea and Holyoke. Holyoke, obviously, as you know, the governor has appointed uh, 
an investigator, someone external to government, to really do a deep dive as to what's happened in Holyoke. Uh, obviously, from Sunday night when we were informed about what happened uh, in the Holyoke Soldiers' Home, we immediately went into action to put in um, an interim management team and to stabilize and understand what was happening, uh, really to stabilize our veterans uh, and to ensure that their care was being taken up, taken care of, and obviously over time we'll understand what happened to Holyoke. What role does the discovery of the, of the I speak to that one. I just want to add one other point to this, which is, um, Part of the reason why it's important to test um, after the fact is a number of our senior care facilities in Massachusetts do have hospice programs. Um, and part of the reason they have hospice programs is um, people don't want to move again if they get very sick. And I think it's critically important that we do test to figure out of the folks um, that were referenced at um, in Norwood, how many of those were COVID-19? How many of those were something else, right? Because that's ultimately going to be important in understanding the nature of the cluster in each of these places. The other thing I would just say is there are protocols in place for every senior care facility in Massachusetts, whether you're talking about um, an assisted living facility, a nursing home, um, a soldier's home. And those protocols involve incident reporting requirements. And those incident reporting requirements are not just about whether or not somebody's tested positive. You know, I mean, we, these things have been in place forever. And if, you've, if you have a fall in your institution, um, you're supposed to report that. If you have somebody who goes to the hospital from your institution for some reason, you're supposed to report that. And those reporting mechanisms are in place for a really good reason, because they give the Department of Public Health guidance with respect to what's actually happening there. One of the biggest differences between Chelsea and some of these other places and the Holyoke Soldiers Home is people were reported. People were doing what they were supposed to do with respect to informing the Department of Public Health and others about incidents that are considered to be critical enough that they are supposed to be reported. You have tweeted yesterday about how no days off. We became a little emotional at the um, Logan yesterday. I've had people say to me, how's the governor holding up? I mean, I don't know. How is the governor holding up? So, um, part of the reason yesterday's event got to me a bit was because we have been chasing personal protective equipment and especially N95 masks basically as much as we've been awake for the past few weeks since we lost that shipment um, that BJ's ordered that we lost at the Port of New York. And as I said in my remarks yesterday, I didn't know if, this, if that particular day or any of these other days that we've been chasing stuff on was ever going to deliver on what it was we were looking for. And, you know, this is to everybody, to all of you, okay, the media who are here and the media who may be watching and to the people who are watching um, this press conference, there's an undeniable fact in all of this, which is that medical personnel, first responders, and emergency management personnel are not just putting themselves in harm's way with the amount of close contact that they have with potential COVID cases every day, but they know that they are also putting their family members in harm's way because they're putting themselves in harm's way. And the Lieutenant Governor and I and the Secretary and other folks in our administration have talked to literally dozens of these people about what their greatest fear is. And it's honestly not about themselves. Their greatest fear is about infecting a family member, a grandmother, a father, a neighbor, a child. That's who they talk about. They don't talk about getting it themselves because they're worried about it, what it might mean for them. They talk about it because they're worried about what it might mean for some other loved one. You hear enough of those stories, and you get pretty bent about your inability to help. 
And so when we finally managed to land the plane yesterday, that was a really big deal. And as I said, and I, you know, I was speaking for all of us, I didn't use the word celebrate yesterday, I used the word gratitude. Because I was grateful that we were able to do something for this community that we should all be enormously grateful for. Whether you're talking about the people driving the bus or, or the rapid transit system or filling your grocery orders or standing on the front lines in public safety or in health care, these people are putting themselves out there. And it was killing us that we weren't able to solve their problem. So yeah, I got a little worked up about it. But honestly, if you've had the kinds of conversations we've had, you know exactly what I'm talking about and why it's so important that we, 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 were, we were able to actually do something for them. Now you combine that with the joint initiative between Partners Health, not this Partners Health, but the other Partners Health and, um, and the Commonwealth and, uh, and the Mass Hospital Association on that decontamination machine from uh, Battelle out in, uh, out in Ohio, which lands um, in Somerville, thanks to a lot of quick work by Mayor Joe Curtitone, um, which will make it possible for us to use a lot of those N95 masks four, five, six, seven, eight times, depending. Um, and you start to feel like you're creating a little bit of a, of a comfort for a lot of people who have been uncomfortable and yet have gone out every single day and done what they do for the rest of us. We should remember that. So um, this investigation that's taking place, and both the Secretary and I and Lieutenant Governor have all talked to Mark Perlstein about this. This is all about, it's about what happened, but it's also about who was talking to who about what when. And I don't want to speak to that until we actually see the results of that investigation, but I'm glad that Mark's on the ground. And one other thing you should know is, uh, I got asked this the other day by somebody in the media on a, just a, it wasn't an on-the-record conversation. He's doing this pro bono. And, um, and his report is going to determine the answers to a whole bunch of questions that we all have. Thanks. Governor, um, do we know what happened to the three million from Port of New York? Three million masks? Well, I'm assuming they went into the federal stockpile. We don't know what they did with them? Uh, I guess, are they in a trailer in the Port of New York? Are they impounded by FEMA? Like that? We've assumed all along that they were just confiscated and that they probably ended up in the stockpile. In the stockpile, okay. Yeah. Governor. Thanks, everybody. Thank we really got to go. Right.